Good morning and welcome to the service today. We're going to ask if you please stand as we begin our service. Sing this like you mean it. I know whom I have believed. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know how I am believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that. Unto him against that day. If you need your hymnals, it's 531. 531. Give you a second. All right. Verse 2. Here we go. I know not how the saving faith to me. by the will of God according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Louise, and your mother, Eunice, and I am pers uh, persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just we just want to take this time to praise and thank you, Lord. We uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for the truth that it represents, Lord. It's steadfast. It's it's uh, just as uh, important today as it was years ago. Lord, we uh, we just thank you uh, that this. 
your word, the truth that it represents, gives us our guidance for our lives, Lord. We get, it gives us hope and direction, Lord. Lord, we uh, just pray uh, for the, all the ministries of this church. Lord, we just uh, we know you're working here, Lord. We uh, we can uh, sense it, and uh, we just ask that you would continue to bless each one of those ministries. I think uh, specifically the KYB and, and the uh, great things that are happening there, Lord. We know that you're behind all of that. Lord, we um, thank you for this church family, Lord, and I just uh, thank you uh, for the uh, uh, fellowship that we can share as, as believers, Lord, and I just uh, know that uh, as a group that uh, great things can be done in this community for you. Lord, we um, pray uh, for our country and the leaders of our country, and certainly as dark as, as things seem at times, Lord, we just have the assurance to know that, uh, that you are in control of all and that uh, uh, we don't have to be concerned about those things, Lord. Lord, I thank you uh, for all of those in the military and the and law enforcement, Lord, we just uh, ask that you would watch over them and guide them and, and keep them safe, Lord, we thank, um, uh, thank you for all of the missionaries that are out there and, and the ones that we uh, are uh, able to support, Lord, we just pray for each one of them that, uh, that they have safety and, and that uh, you can put them into situations that they're effective and, and that they uh, can uh, continue your, your word and pass your word uh, throughout the world. Lord, we uh, pray for those uh, within our church family uh, uh, with physical needs, Lord, we uh, think of Carol Rosman and uh, we just are so uh, encouraged uh, by the positive news that's uh, come uh, recently. Lord, we just uh, pray that you continue to strengthen her, comfort her, uh, continue to give her uh, the appetite that she's uh, uh, that's coming back. Lord, we just uh, are so encouraged by that, and we thank you um, for her example as well, Lord, that uh, through the toughest times, um, her uh, faith still shines through. Lord, we um, uh, praise you and, and thank you for this new birth, uh, the shop family. We just uh, uh, thank you for that and, and that uh, it was a healthy, um, healthy birth. Lord, again, we thank you for your presence here the, this morning with us. Lord, we uh, just thank you uh, for the great love that you have for us and all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be... Oh. You may be seated. Thank you. We're really grateful to see what God's doing in KYB. Um, he's really been moving in our midst uh, around Christmas time. Brad had a little boy. He had a lesson and had a gift, and in the gift was a cross. And the little um, boy stayed afterwards to talk to him and I uh, about giving his life to Christ. And I saw him in the hallway at school. I said, I heard something about you. He said, what? I said, I heard you gave your life to the Lord. He just beamed from ear to ear. He was so very happy. And we reach a lot of kids that what they get at KYB is all they get. I remember we had a teenager who came in recently, and she said, I'm really nervous about this. I said, you'll be all right. I'll walk you back. She said, why are there so many teachers here? I said, well, you'll, you'll be okay. And I walked her back. And She's been coming ever since, and Daryl and Katie say she's really participating and learning. We have a young man in my group who, when he came in, he sat down. He didn't want to sing. He didn't want to participate. He said, um, my dad's an atheist. I never pray. I said, well, maybe God will touch your heart like he touched mine. And I looked over at him this week. He's singing away, and I thought, we're going to get him. <laughs> And um, we had a girl a couple of years ago who gave her life to Christ, and she comes every week, and she listens so intently. It's convicting. I always think, anybody's listening like that to me, I better have something to say. And she brings her friends, and after they've come a while, she'll, she'll talk to them, and she'll say, you know, you can go back and talk to Mrs. Kellogg if you want to. And about three weeks ago, she had a friend who came back, and said, I want to give my life to the Lord. So sweet, gave her life to Christ. And um, this last week, we had a, 
uh, two young girls who stayed afterwards after the lesson. We had a lesson on Jacob and his commitment to God. If God will do all I, he wants me to do, then I'll serve him and, and give him the tithe. And we talked about God wants a commitment from your heart where you give him everything. And we talked about that commitment. And so we, uh, I said, if anyone wants to talk to me, you can stay during the um, game time. Well, if you know game time at KYB, I mean, it's mass exodus. It's life or death to get first to Isaac Moritz so that they can get into the gym first. And two little girls were hanging back, and I, I, yes, they said, we want to talk to you. I said, oh. So we went back, and both of them gave their hearts to the Lord. So sweet. But during all this, one of our workers had a real passion to help everybody to be more comfortable sharing the gospel. And so she had taken, she'd be in there when I talked to somebody, and she'd take it word for word and wrote it all down, and then we edited it and re-edited it and re-edited it, and she printed up a track. It's for workers. It's a guideline on how to win somebody to Christ. How do you know they're ready? How do you know what to say? And it's not really just for our work, because I've had parents recently who said, my kid's asking questions. How do I know they're ready? What do I say? And so um, I wanted to encourage you. This is just a step-by-step, -step, clear format of how to talk to somebody about Christ. And we're going to meet today from about 5 to 5.45 before life groups. And I'd just like to encourage you to make sure that you're really not just comfortable, but confident when you share the gospel with someone. And I want to ask you to pray for our KYB. We have kids that need the Lord, and it's so sweet to see our church kids bringing their friends. And it's so neat to see our church people investing in the lives of others. And I can't think of anything more valuable than getting to eternity and singing praises to God, and looking over there, and there's somebody at KYB we won to Christ. I can't think of anything more important. These are our marching orders from God as believers to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I want to make sure that you can do this and you can do this well. And I'd like to ask you to pray. I'd like you to invite you to come and get equipped. Even if you already know, just to be better at it and more confident at it. And I'd like to challenge you. A lot of our kids come, not because of game time, not because of the snack, although that's a high priority, not because of the lesson, not because of the song time. They come because somebody cares about them. And they come in and they look for that one person that loves them. And we live in a world where that's sometimes all they get. And if you'd like to be one of those people who can invest, and care about someone, I'd like to invite you to join it. It's worth it. Good morning again. Good to see you all. Uh, I have a few more announcements to follow that. Uh, just a reminder tonight at 6 p.m. we have life groups and the Bible study for teens and kids. Please come if you're able. We'd love to see you there. Uh, Wednesday night as well, we have KYB and the teen program at 6.30. Please join us there. Uh, just as a reminder, there is no choir practice tonight. So if you come, no one else will be there. So don't, don't do that. Uh, the, we have a new picture directory we're working on, so please remember to fill out an information sheet for that and email us a picture or sign up so we can get that picture taken for you if that's what you desire. So we also have a lost and found tote here at the church, and it is full. So if you think you might be missing something, please go check the tote. It could be yours. And last but not least, I uh, wanted to uh, let everyone know that the Schaup family had their young daughter this morning, and we need to be praying for them. Uh, so I would encourage you all, if you see them or interact with them, to give them prayer and also to encourage them 
with, your, with, with fellowship and whatever you feel is best. So thank you so much. And if you want to know details, I'm sure there's a couple people that could fill you in on that. I will, I will at least let you know her, her name. Her name is Gina Lynn. If you would, please stand as we sing our worship songs together this morning.
thank you and please be seated. Amen. 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 Um, give you a head start to find uh, 2 Timothy. How's that? 2 Timothy chapter 1. And it's been about five years since uh, 1 Timothy. How many, of you, how many of you believe that a lot of things can happen in five years? When 1 Timothy was written... You could write across the top of it the word tolerance. Christians were being tolerated. But now we're five years removed from that. Now you could write across 2 Timothy the word tribulation. You think maybe God wants to prepare us for what's next in our history? I'm not here to paint a black picture for you this morning, but I am here to prepare you for the inevitable our country is going further and further and further away from God. We push rewind back to the first century. And I'm telling you, just a year or two after Paul wrote these words, they took him, some believed, and they cut his head off. Tribulation. Right now we're being tolerated. I don't know if we've got five years, but tribulation's coming. So that, in part, is why Paul wrote this little book. But I don't know about you, but I'd want to sit and pay attention. Well, how do we face these uh, days in which we live? It's all right here. But there's something more than that, and that's what we want to focus on this morning. I don't know if you heard the word Beth used. It's the word investment. One of the things that we should be doing is investing in the next generation. Because we may have 50 years to live, right? And we want to pass the baton to the next generation. Now, some of you know I had my birthday this week. Don't make much about that since it's last week. I would not refer to it last week because then you might shower me with birthday cards. And many of you did, and I, I, prayed, I thank you for that. By the way, I see the Bengal shirt going here this morning. I like that, okay? I like your quarterback. What's his name? What is it? I love Joe Burrow. I love Joe Burrow. Uh, but anyway, I forgot where I was going. See, you get these birthdays long enough, you, you get forgetful. That was my point. But I, I did hear about a guy this week, and it made me feel good, because I, I, I think I'm forgetful, but I'm not nearly as forgetful as this guy was. I'll tell you real quickly. I have a long version, short version. I'll tell you what happened. You remember the day when you could take your car to curbside parking when you went to the airport? Well, this guy was a businessman. I think he was out in Los Angeles somewhere. He took his car to the curbside. And he had a lot to do that morning. He ran his errands, packed his bags, and he's a businessman, so he's got to go like two weeks overseas somewhere, and he does this all the time. Looks at his watch, says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm behind schedule. I've got to make this quick. He goes to the airport, takes his stuff inside, and uh, he goes through security. He finds his, uh, what do you call that, where you wait to get on the plane, your, um, I'm forgetful, what is it? Gate, whatever, board, boarding area. And uh, he gets on the plane. He says, thinks to himself, I I'm forgetting something. I'm forgetting something. Gets on the plane. It's a national, international flight. So they get out over the, the water, the Pacific somewhere. And he sits down. At, well, he's already sitting down. But it dawns on him. When the plane levels off at cruising altitude, it dawns on him. I remembered what I forgot. When I pulled my car up to the curbside parking, I left it running. I never went out to park it in long-term parking range. So he's up in the air and... Don't be forgetful, okay? If you use curbside parking, make sure your car is parked in the long-term parking lot. Paul was not forgetful, among other things, to uh, hand the baton to the next generation. That's what we're going to look at this morning. How to, how to invest in something. How do you really do that? How do you invest in the next generation? And, you know, um, it won't be long, and all of us are going to have to stand before the Lord. Do you believe that? Just do the math for a moment. Less than two weeks ago, two weeks ago, the Georgia Bulldogs were going to play Texas Christian University out in California. SoFi Stadium, right, for the national championship. 
Number 77 is an offensive lineman for the Georgia Bulldogs, Devin Wilcox. Willock is his name, Willock. I've been following this story all week. Because last Sunday morning, they won the championship Monday night. Last Sunday morning, last Saturday, they came back to Athens, Georgia, and they celebrated. There was a parade, and there was a video clip of him standing on top of a, a bus or a truck or something, and he's like right in the middle of the crowd just enjoying himself. They won back-to-back -back national championships. Is that a big deal? In our country, it is. But I don't know, he must have stayed out late that night or something because uh, he was in a car with uh, three other people and they came around a curve near the um, University of Georgia and the driver lost control and hit a telephone pole, snapped the telephone pole in two, hit two trees, ended up on the side of an apartment complex. And this 20-year-old from New Jersey, Devin Willock, was ushered out into eternity. Now, you may have read that and went on to something else, but I kind of locked into it and been following that story. all week. I said, To me, that's unbelievable. What, a, what an unbelievable, tragic turn of events where you're on top of the world. It doesn't get any higher than that. And, you know, NFL prospects are, are looking at you. In less than two weeks, he's ushered out into eternity. But what I notice is I'm following this story. I, I checked into it last Monday morning, got my attention. I've been following. What got my attention is how the, how the media has been spinning this. You know, they'd like to lock on to something and develop the good in all this. And evidently, just hours before he died, they must have stopped at a restaurant. And there was a grandfather there who wanted so desperately to have his, his grandson's photo taken with this Devin Willock. And so Devin Willock obliged. And so this grandfather must have got his cell phone number somehow, and so he tweeted him or texted him. I don't know how these things work, but he said, special thank you to Devin Willock for taking time for my grandson when he didn't have to. You went out of your way to make him feel special. You made his day. Good luck next year. Go dogs. Devin Willock turned around and resent that message, he reposted it, this article says. The shout out with three hearts less than an hour later. And the moment clearly meant a lot to Willock as he quoted in his last tweet with a red heart emoji before his tragic accident. Strange that the news media picked up on the fact that he invested in a little boy before he went out into eternity. I just had that thought in my mind all the way. That's what Paul is doing for Timothy. He knows it's just a matter of hours before they execute me. But Timothy, guess what? You're a young pastor. And I get it. You're timid. You're shy. You're a little backward. I get that. But I'm going to give you some medication here. Because I want you, Timothy, to stand strong when the difficult days arrive. So think about it. From tolerance to tribulation. And Paul's aim in part in this book is that this man might be triumphant. God wants you and your children and your grandchildren to be triumphant when the difficult days of adversity roll in. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that, to me, that's how the book starts. And if you look at this, as I look at verse 1, I see some instant encouragement. How many of you just need some instant encourage, encouragement once in a while? I mean... I, Sometimes when I drive long distances, and the older I get, it's hard to stay awake. Anybody? 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 I remember I shouldn't have done this. In hindsight, I should, should have never done it, but I did it. Anyway, my wife went to be with her mother. I forget the occasion, and she, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grown dependent on my wife. I, and when she's not there, I miss her. I cry, weep, and that sort of thing. I walk around the house crying. Why are you laughing? <laughs> You'll get it one day, Brad. But anyway, she was down visiting, and uh, I, I was supposed to go to the next week and meet up with them down there. And I had a late meeting one night. I forget. It might have been a Monday night board meeting. I think that's what it was. And it's one of those extra long. I said, come on, guys. i gotta get. I got to leave. I should have gone home and gone to bed. But uh, I didn't. After the long meeting, I got in my car. And I drove. And about four hours into this thing, I mean, it seemed like every other exit I was exiting. 
And I drank, you know, probably two of those liters of Mountain Dew, you know, that sort of thing, coffee. And finally arrived safe and sound, and I, I just crashed when I got to the other end. My point in telling you all that is once in a while, I need a shot of encouragement, just an instant picker up, all right? Do you need that? Anybody here like that? Anybody need a little, do you meet anybody that needs a little instant shot in the arm? Because that's what I see in verse 1. Instant encouragement is what I've got written over in my mind. Instant encouragement, get the shot in the arm. But then in verses, the ones Mark read, 2 through 6, I've got the intense encouragement. How many need encouragement? How many of you think that you might meet somebody this week who's going to need encouragement? By the way, did you know your children need lots and lots of encouragement? I love it. This week was my birthday. My daughter surprised me. She FaceTimed me. She never does that. She FaceTimes me. And it's my two grandchildren in Pennsylvania. And they sing to me. Happy birthday. Remember that? It's the most beautiful thing in the world. I'm just instantly encouraged. And I, I've got a grandson now. I love it because, you know, he's just sitting there with a kind of a, he's just there. And you can see he's looking in the picture for somebody. And when he sees granddad, all of a sudden he just brightens up, granddad. You know? I'm getting old. I'm telling too many stories. Instant encouragement, that's where I was. Look with me at verse 1 of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 1. Let's see if I can bring this up here this morning. There it is. If you really want to invest in the lives of other people, this is how I understand this. You've got to instill confidence in them, okay? They, they need lots and lots of, your children need confidence to stand strong for Jesus Christ when the billows begin to roll. So he says, instant encouragement, number one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. This word struck me when I dug into it. By the will of God. Literally, the desire, get this, the determination of God. Hey, will that encourage you? Number one, service, young pastor, ought to be an honor. Now, I say he's writing to pastor. I, I get that, especially. But he's writing to you. He's writing to me. He's writing to all of us. And he says, number one, did you know service is an honor? It's more important than the president's appointment by the will of the people that God looked down from heaven and he chose you. Instant shot in the arm. Number two, usually when you talk to people, if you want to carry on an in-depth conversation, if you've never met them before, you ask them a simple question. What kind of work do you do, right? Paul tells us what kind of work he did. Me? I have been determined. It's God's desire that I'm doing what I'm doing. That gives me confidence. But my job description is to be a sent one. Notice privileges have responsibilities. Would you agree? My responsibility is to be eager in telling all men that what God has done for others like me, he can do for you. Instant encouragement. Being a believer in Jesus Christ is the great, greatest privilege in the world, but it's also a great responsibility. So I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now notice, according to the promise, what is a promise? Did you know we walk by faith and not by sight? A promise is from the lips of God. And if God said it, it's guaranteed that it will happen. Amen? The service is a pleasure. I have the great promises of God. But what I want to do now, and by the way, if you ask me, Paul was just sort of taxiing out to the runway and getting ready to take off in verse 1. I mean, I don't know how many times I've flown, but for some reason I asked my wife, may I please sit by the window? And I like to just look down and take it all in before the pilot hammers the throttle and <laughs> here we go, right? He's taxied out to the runway. An apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promises of Zoe, life. Timothy, I love you so much. I want to give you some intense encouragement. So, number one, Timothy, I want you to know, I want you to know you're deeply loved. Parents, your children need to know they're deeply loved. 
If you're trying to pass the baton to the next generation, KYB workers, Sunday school teachers, deacons and deaconesses and elders, whoever you might be, pastor, uh, the people that you serve need to know and really know. And there are ways of communicating without saying it that you really love them. So notice what he says to Timothy. Notice my dearly beloved son. Now, one thing I'm going to stop and say as I'm studying 2 Timothy now, I'm noticing that it's a lot more emotional than 1 Timothy. I think there's a reason for that. I think Paul knows at any moment they may come into this Mamertine prison where I'm sitting, chained to other inmates, maybe guards. And at any moment, they're going to lead me out of here to be executed. Hence, we're very emotional now. When you talk to people on their deathbed, it's very emotional. And as a pastor, my job once in a while is to go up. I'm trying to think of the name of that place on the second floor of the old hospital. Hospice. And I know, getting off that elevator, I say a quick prayer up to God. I say, God, I don't know what I'm about to see what I'm about to run into, but I know one thing, Lord, I need your help. Somebody here is about to go out into eternity, and there's probably going to be family members. It's going to be very emotional. Help me to stay on message. So notice what he says. Dearly beloved. Now, I went back. You don't have to do this because I did your homework for you. But 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2 says, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Do you see already how much more emotional this is? In chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he says, my dearly beloved son. What Paul is communicating to the next generation is, you are deeply, deeply loved. But notice at the end of verse 2, he's not finished with this. Not just dearly loved, but you're divinely loved. Do you see it? Grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. By the way, Christ is not Jesus as his last name. It wasn't Mary and Joseph Christ. It wasn't that. I hope you know that. Christ literally means the anointed one. Slash the king. Let's read it that way. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and King Jesus our Lord. Now, it's interesting to me to observe this. Paul wrote, I think, 14 New Testament epistles. And every time he starts, with the exception of Hebrews, he starts with the word Paul. Look at your text here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus. But when he writes, we call them pastoral epistles, when he's writing to a pastor like Timothy, he puts the word mercy in this grouping with grace, mercy, and peace. You look at the other epistles and it, just, it will just say grace and peace to you. And I find it very interesting when he writes to a pastor, he says grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, young pastor, you're going to need God's grace. It's not just what saves you, but it's what empowers you. You know, it's like a computer. You ever see the little decal that says uh, something about Intel on the inside of it? I'm not a computer geek. Some of you are. But I know enough to know this. The externals of a computer are not enough. It's what's on the inside that drives it. I could go out and buy a nice four-wheel drive truck. Someday, a four-wheel drive truck. <laughs> Someday. I used to have a two-wheel drive truck. Did I tell you about my two-wheel drive? My wife never liked it because she thought, it's four people in our family. Get a grip, man. We, we need room in this thing. And I rode around all over Arlington, Hancock County with my red Toyota little truck. That brings back a lot of memories. One day a four-wheel drive. But what if I went out and got a four-wheel drive truck and didn't put gas in it? I'm telling you, that's what grace is. Timothy, you're going to need God's grace. And notice I put the asterisk here because you're also going to need God's mercy. And Timothy, you're also you're going to need God's peace. Some of you might need that right now. You need to know that you're not just dearly loved by the KYB worker. Or the Sunday school teacher. Or someone on the pulpit committee who is praying for you. But you need to know that beyond the individual, you're divinely loved by God. Would, would that encourage you? 
to know God up in heaven knows that you need grace, you need mercy, you need his peace. So number one, you're deeply loved. Number two, this is interesting to me. What's the best thing you could do with those who serve underneath your leadership, your children, your Sunday school teacher? Look at verse three, your Sunday school student. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers that with pure conscience, without ceasing, I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day. Now, I find it interesting the way Paul worded this. I'm think, trying to think through it. And he first of all tells me who he is, and then he goes on to tell me how he does it. Evidently, it must be important the kind of person who's praying because that's what he seems to focus on first. So let's focus on that. I, if you ask me, what I think he's saying is, you know what? The best prayers come from people who are walking uprightly in tune with the Lord and they're actually down in the trenches and they're serving him. I appreciate it if you tell me you're praying for me. I really appreciate that. The more the merrier. Hallelujah. Praise God. But I'm saying the way Paul seemed to word this, he went out of his way to tell us that, Timothy, I'm not just praying for you. I want you to understand the kind of individual who is praying for you. Okay, I hope I make that clear. My service, Paul says, the first thing, look at verse 3. I don't serve out of drudgery because I have to. Have you ever noticed this? Paul says, hey, I thank God. By the way, why is he imprisoned? You have to go way back over to Acts 21 and read the rest of the book of Acts. I think there's 28 chapters. And you'll discover that the reason he got arrested to begin with is because uh, he was accused. There's no evidence of it, but he was accused of taking somebody, a Gentile, into the temple. There was a big riot. They arrested him, and you read about him standing before Agrippa, and you read about him standing before Felix. You read about him, his, his what was it, his trip across the uh, Mediterranean uh, on, the, on his way to Rome. He's over there because he was serving the Lord. Is he bitter? Is he angry? Of course not. He's in a position of communion. You know, the best workers are workers who are serving with a smile on their face, not because it's forced, not because it's fake, but because they're in communion with the Lord. Amen. Don't you like to meet a worker like that? Don't you like to meet a Sunday school teacher who's happy? It's so good to see you. Not if you're an adult, maybe you don't want to be treated like a child, but you know how it is. If you want to win somebody, you, you have to have your heart in communion with the Lord. Notice he goes on to say, I thank God whom I've been serving literally from my forefathers. So I had to think through that this week. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Paul was on the road to Damascus. This light shines out of heaven, knocks him to the ground. He goes and sees Ananias. And then he's let over the side of the wall in Damascus. And he goes out to a wilderness area, Arabia. Some think it's modern-day Turkey. But he went out into the wilderness. And he was there for three years getting his theology hammered out. And it struck me. Wait a minute. Three years. That's what we think. How long were the disciples tagging with Jesus? About three years. Something about those three years that he had to get his doctrine in order. So he says, way back when I was saved and those people like Ananias and so many others, those who let me down by a basket from Damascus, and I met others along the journey. I've served, I've served, I've served, I've been consistent. But notice, if someone is really going to get their prayers answered, notice this part of it, with a pure conscience. Now, notice what he's doing. He's telling us the kind of individual that he is, first of all. Before, in the rest of this verse, he tells us how he prays. So please don't miss the first part. You want to tell me that you're praying for me? I want you to know I'm praying for you. You can go to my office right now and you can see my prayer journal if you need to. It's got your name on it if you're a member of this church. It's got your, it's got your children's name on it. And you're being prayed for. And it matters the quality of person who's praying for you. Are they walking with the Lord? Are they in communion? Are they consistent? Do they have a pure, clean heart? What did James say? That's the brother of Jesus. He said the effectual, fervent prayer of a, what kind of a man? A righteous man does what? Goes a long way, avails much. Right? You're not agreeing with, is anybody listening to what I'm saying? 
Okay. It helps once in a while if you just amen or, you know, we allow that. Maybe, maybe it's the tie this morning. It's a little too dignified. Maybe that's what it is. could be. That's the kind of person he was. Now he tells us the kind of praying that he did. Does that make sense to anybody? Or is it just me? Are my prayers persistent? He says that without ceasing. You got to keep praying. I know I was there this week with you, Bob, by the bedside of your wife. And there was one morning, I never will forget it, you and I didn't think she was going to make it this week. But that's been quite a roller coaster. I've been with you on that emotionally. Because the next day I come back and she's sitting up in bed and smiling and chatting. But I'm telling you, earlier in the week, we didn't know if she was going to make it. She dearly loves the Lord. She forever talks about God being her shepherd, her rock, her fortress. It, it's, just, it's, it's instructive for me as her pastor to go there and see somebody who's genuine. No matter up here, no matter down here. Paul says, that's my prayers. I'm persistent without ceasing. I pray for you making mention of you in my prayers. And my prayers are very, very consistent, persistent, perpetual. You know, you look at the Old Testament, you'll see Daniel. The reason why he was thrown into the lion's den, he wouldn't stop praying. They passed a decree, and they, this, this right-wing fundamentalist, this weird guy, who opens his windows toward Jerusalem, and he just prays morning, noon, and night. We know how to stop him. We'll get a petition signed by the king, and we'll make a decree, right? And so they, they finagle things and work things around. And guess what Daniel kept doing? You got your decree. You have to have your decree, but I'm going to keep praying. And they threw Daniel into the lion's pit. And now he's one of our heroes. But his prayers were persistent. His prayers were personal. His prayers were perpetual. And Paul said to Timothy, I'm praying for you. But look at verse 4. He just liked being around the guy. Notice the emotional roller coaster here. I greatly desire to see you, mindful of your tears. But when I see you face to face, Timothy, I'll be filled with joy. You see the emotion in that? If you keep reading this book, you'll see at the end of the book of 2 Timothy, Paul appointed a man by the name of Tychicus. Say that three times. Tychicus. To take Timothy's place as pastor at Ephesus. While Timothy could unplug from the church and go over and literally be with Paul in prison. Remember, that's when he told him, bring the parchments. And oh, by the way, it's wintertime, so please bring my coat. But... I, I long. Timothy, you're not, a, you're not in my way. You're not a burden to me. I love it, Timothy, when I, when I see you once again, mindful of your tears so I can be filled with joy. Well, number one, verses one through four, he instills confidence. But the next thing I notice in verse five, if you want to invest in someone, you have to inspire their character. Interesting to me when I read the New Testament, that's never translated. That is the word character. The idea is there, and the closest we get to it is the image of God. Think about that as a definition for character. What is character? You're becoming more and more and more like Jesus Christ. That's character. He says, when I call to remember, Timothy, your character, you have unfeigned faith. And we'll unpackage this in just a moment. I just want to show you what's, what's, what we're looking at. Which dwelt, first of all, it's genuine. It's generational. It dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And you know what? I'm guaranteed, I'm, I'm persuaded that it also dwells in you. Now, now how, about, how about getting this as a letter from the great apostle Paul? He believes in me. He believes I have genuine faith. He believes it's generational. And he believes it's guaranteed in me. That's quite a statement if you ask me. That's how you invest in other people. So let's unpackage this real quickly. Number one, I think he's saying, Timothy, is your faith real? I think he wants to ask you this one. Is your faith real? Is your faith real? 
This word unfeigned literally means genuine. How are we looking? Everybody with me this morning? Everybody still out there? Is, I asked the question, is your faith genuine? Yeah, I was just reading this week. I thought it was hilarious. This guy that uh, needed a job. So he read the uh, classified, and he saw at a local zoo they needed a, uh, a gorilla. Someone to dress up as a gorilla because their gorilla died, and they needed somebody to dress up and act like a gorilla. The guy says, I think I can do that. He had never done this before, never dressed up and act like a gorilla, but he, he, he got the job. So he went to the gorilla cage, and he wanted to impress the crowds when they started coming in, and he did backflips, and the crowd would applaud. And he did, you know, tried to scare the crowd. The crowd would applaud. And he thought, I'm going to go for broke here. He jumped up on the wall and did a backflip on the wall, but he was next to the lion's den. And he fell into the lion's den. Yeah. And he started screaming. Ah! <laughs> and the lion said, shh, <laughs> be quiet. Are you going to get, a, get us both fired? <laughs> That's why I don't tell jokes. You usually get them Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday the following week. Or your wife has to explain it to you, you know. But I read that aloud. That's hypocrisy. <laughs> How many of us live like that? We play the role. Paul said with clear conscience, Timothy, one thing I remember about you, and I remember it well, you got the job because of your character. I remember coming to your little town, Timothy, and I remember you standing there when they took me outside and they stoned me and left me for dead. I remember that. And I want you to know it was during that time I led your grandmother and your mother got saved. And, and they invested in you. I'm confident that you're going to have genuine faith just like they did. So number one, if you want to inspire character, ask yourself, is my faith genuine? By the way, if you're here this morning without Christ, you've come to the right place. We can help you with that. You don't have to leave those doors the same way you came in. If you're not genuinely, genuinely, genuinely ready for heaven. Sunday school, we looked at this. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, a religious leader, that except you're born from above, Anathon, again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Number two, does my faith have a root system to it? Is it generational? God bless the Christians in this room who not only have parents but grandparents and maybe great-grandparents who knew the Lord. There's something to that. And Paul could tell this young man, I'm so grateful that this genuine faith took up residence and it influenced your grandmother who influenced your mother. And that's why, Timothy, I know it's going to influence you. Because as my wife mentioned, we live in a very conservative part of the world, northwest Ohio. We live in Hancock County. God is blessed. But even in this little bitty village, I know because I've been there, I've been in homes where there are single parent homes and they don't have this gift. Timothy, you have the gift. Your grandmother was saved and, and God's salvation dwelt in her. First of all, Lois, that's an interesting word. How would you like to have a grandmother who's pleasant? Will that go a long way? I mean, I thank God for my wife. She happens to be a grandmother. And our two grandchildren over an extreme eastern edge of Pennsylvania, they want to come back to grandmom's house for some reason. We want to see the choo-choo train, right? Choo-choo! I mean, and they go nuts when the choo-choo train. That's just a little bitty thing, but they want to be at grandmom's house. What's, the, what's that little thing in our room that's up top and it's... it's um, Disney character. What's that? Kanga, thank you. We want to see Kanga. It's a big stuffed animal, but that's a different story. I can see I'm losing some people, so let me press on here. <laughs> Dwelt in your grandmother Lois. And also, this is an interesting word, dug into it. The word Eunice, you, literally Nike. Ever heard of Nike? Nike is a Greek goddess of victory. I was just saying. How would you like to have a mother who's noted for 
being a godly woman, a Christian woman, who's got the victory, even in difficult times. That, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you've got to go around with a smile painted on your face. I know life is real. I know life is tough. I've been in the hospital. I've been in the jail this week. I, I know life is tough for some. I get it. But imagine having a mother who's noted for being a good Christian woman who's victorious. Larry, I see you sitting back there this morning. That's what comes to my mind when I think of your mother. Remember her? She was an outstanding Christian woman. And it seemed like every time I'd go over there, she was on top side. She had the victory. Praise the Lord. She'd make you a taco if you stayed long enough. Remember that, Larry? You had a wonderful mother and father, by the way. But anyway. So is my faith real? Does it have roots? And is it being reinforced? Is there someone that looks at you and says, you can do this? Timothy, I'm telling you, the winds have shifted. We lived in a time of tolerance. Tribulation is coming. I want you to be the man, play the role, be the man. How do I do that? I want you to know I've got your back. I believe in you. And I want to be here to reinforce you. How many of you, don't raise your hand. How many of you read yesterday morning's paper? I just go through a routine, and one of the things I check off, I read the local news. I like to keep up with what's going on. How many of you saw on the front page of the paper yesterday? I thought, thank you, Lord. Another sermon illustration right here, plain sight. About a young man from Macomb whose mother was off radar, I think doing drugs or something, if I remember the story correctly, had to take care of his two siblings. And he could barely stay above water because he was doing all these other things he needed to, to do. But when he was in the seventh grade, he stayed, I think it was a little extra longer taking a test. I think that's how it goes. And his seventh grade teacher looked at him in the eye and said, you know something? You ought to think about becoming the valedictorian of your class. Remember that? And one thing led to another. The light bulb went off. Wait a minute. Somebody believes in me. Somebody thinks I can do this. And so one thing led to another, and he started pushing himself. He started joining these different groups, and he did the unthinkable. He applied for a, to become a student at Harvard University, one of, if not the most prestigious college in our country. And what is it, 4% only get accepted? Some kid in North West Hancock County, Macomb area, is going to become a student. He's now officially enrolled at Harvard University. And when he found out, it brought tears to his eyes. And you read this article carefully. He gives credit to his seventh grade teacher, looked him in the eye and said, you can do this. You can do it. I tell you, it made me think, how many people invested in me that way as a kid? Especially after I got saved, I can just tell you, Mrs. Mildred Revels and her husband, Clayton Revels. And there was Jim Moore. I think her name was Bonnie Moore. Those are my youth leaders. And they, they looked at me. They would take me out and, and witnessing with them and sharing the gospel. And they would, Mrs. Revels sat down with them. We'll forget it. At Wendy's one day, of all places. I was enjoying my milkshake. And she, said, she got up real close in my face. And she said, you know, Brother Kellogg. That's how we talk down there. You know, Brother Kellogg. <laughs> You've told me that God uh, has been working in your life. Yes, ma'am, he's been. Maybe he wants you to be a pastor. And she said, you know, Brother Kellogg, that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Now, that one stuck with me. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. So in large part, she's responsible for me being here this morning. But there are so many people who did what happened to this young man, had folks that believed in them. How do you invest in the lives of others practically? Number one, instill confidence, inspire character, and you inflame this burning passion that will never go away. That's what Paul did for Timothy. I put you in remembrance to stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. Now, I want you to notice something because I tried to find it. It's not there. The only place we can find the word stir up in the Greek, in the New Testament, is right here. 
some of you have fireplaces. One day after I get my four-wheel drive truck, I want to have a fireplace, okay? Let's just, just, put, just make a note of that. Because I grew up with it, pot-belly stove. And once in a while, you got to take your poker, and you got to get that thing all worked up again, right? Sometimes it's possible for Christians just to go through the motions and just sort of die down and fizzle out. And just sort of, you know, endure. But Paul said, Timothy, I want you to stir up the gift. Every believer in Jesus Christ has a gift, and you need to find out what that is and get that thing stoked, stirred up. So what I did was I did find that this word is used in what we call the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. It's, it's used in Genesis chapter 45. So I went back there, and I started studying the context, and I saw how the word was used. And this is right in the middle of Joseph's story. How many of you are reading the book of Joseph if you're reading through the Bible? And you remember Joseph is the one, the youngest brother, who got thrown into a pit, sold to the Midianites. And, and you got to do about 12 years beyond that when he finally sees his brothers eye to eye once again. Think about that. Think, think about all the things he went through. Now he's second in all of Egypt. And his brothers come to his doorstep and they're begging for food. Imagine the sovereignty of God in all the details there. And it took about 12 years before Joseph met them. What would you do if you had 12 years to seethe on this? To be bitter. Well, Joseph never did get bitter. He forgave them. He recognized them. I'm going to just condense chapter 45, Genesis. And Joseph says, and this is very emotional, by the way, when you read it. Does my father yet live? Then he reconciled with him. He said, come near to me. This is, by the way, genuine biblical Christianity 101 at its finest. And then he reassured them, God sent me, sovereignty of God, he sent me here. Now, yeah, you meant evil in your hearts, I, I get that, but God had a bigger purpose. His sovereignty led me here to preserve life. And then there was that exchange, is my brother yet living? No, he's living. Well, I want you to go get him and bring him here. So they went up out of Egypt came to the land of Canaan, Jacob, their father, and they told, hey, Joseph is yet alive, Dad. He's governor over all the land of Egypt. And his heart fainted, became sluggish, seized, crushed, because he didn't believe the message. That's why his heart fainted. And that's why your heart faints. That's why my heart faints. That's why our hearts need to be stirred up. God really is going to use that next generation person that you're investing in. That you're praying for. That you're role modeling. Okay? You've got to believe that. So they told him all the words of Joseph, which he said to them. And when he notice words and then visual, audio visual. When he saw the wagons which Joseph sent to carry him, his spirit, here's the word, here's the word, stir up. It revived. It revived. It revived. And Israel said, it is enough. And Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I'll go and see him before he dies. Do you believe God can take that little boy that comes to your KYB or Sunday school class, is backward, his clothes are dirty, he hasn't had a bath in two days. Do you believe that God can take that young man or that young girl and really use him for his glory. Paul looked at Timothy, though. I believe in you, son. You got what it takes, but I'm here to help you stoke the fire. I'll close with this, but it just makes it practical and real for me. I heard about this prospector that went out west to mine gold and he went up in the mountains and he stayed there for several months. And he decided to come out of the mountain and go down into the town, western town. And down in the town there was this uh, young gunslinger. He had two six-shooters on his side. He was twirling one gun around like this and shooting it up in the air. And here came the old prospector in the town on his mule. So the young gun thought he'd have some fun. 
He said to the old man on his mule, he said, Sir, do you dance? The guy got off his mule and stood in front of him. He said, No, I don't dance. He took his other six shooter and he started shooting around his feet and said, You're going to dance now. And he shot around the guy's feet and boy, did he dance. <laughs> and when he was finished with his other six shooter, the old prospector pulled out his sawed, sawed off shotgun and aimed it at him and said, Have you ever kissed a mule? <laughs> <laughs> Never in my life, but I, I, I've been wanting to. <laughs> if you believe something, it makes all the difference in the world. I have a news article here from Tony Dungy. You ever heard of him? Did you know that guy always getting himself in hot water? Here he is. He's forever getting himself in hot water. I didn't think he was going to get out of it this week, but he did. I saw him last night before the game started, commentating before the, uh, who was it, Kansas City played uh, Jacksonville, I believe it was. On Friday of this week, he was in Washington at the National Right to Life March. And boy, was he raked over the coals for saying this. Speaking at the March of Life rally, he talks about, he talked about the prayers that were offered up for Damar Hamlin. You heard of that name? Number three. Buffalo Bills. Dungy talked about the prayers offered up for Hamlin after the Bills' safety collapse during January 2 game against the Bengals. And compared the situation to the stance of anti-abortion advocates. And Dungy said prayers for Hamlin were answered. And that the lesson from that situation was that the game was canceled because a life was at stake. And people wanted to see that life saved. There are people who aren't necessarily religious, but they got together and called on God. Well, that should be an encouragement to us, he said, because that's exactly what we're here to do. Because every day in this country, innocent lives are at stake, Dungy said, and the only difference is they don't belong to a famous athlete, and they're not seen on national TV. But those lives are still important to God and in his eyes. Oh, Father, thank you that there are people like Tony Dungy who have the character, the boldness to stand up regardless of the news media and how they'll twist things and speak the truth in love. And I thank you for Paul's address to Timothy because it's certainly enlightening to me and it's very instructive for how we can help the next generation. I pray you'd help us to incorporate these character qualities that we saw today, that you might use us to see many others not only coming to Christ, but being invested in so they can carry the torch long after we're gone. Work in this invitation in a mighty way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to stand together and sing a chorus of amazing grace together. Would you sing that with us?
hope you'll have a safe uh, passage home. Please be careful in the parking lot. Father, we love you and thank you so much for the beautiful snow that fell this morning. I guess when I saw it, I was reminded of how we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, made whiter than snow. We thank you for that. And we thank you, Father, beyond that, that you have gifted us, something you've embedded us 